Right. Hello and welcome to the Oxford Forum for Questioning Extremism's second event of Michaelmas Term, a panel discussion on electoral interference and the 2020 US election. The topic we are discussing today is arguably one of the foremost issues of our time, and we want to uncover the depth of the threats posed to democracy by interference tactics. We'd like to take this moment to extend a huge thank you to our sponsors for this event, T45, a new news service providing the facts we need in this age of misinformation. Certainly, there is much ground for us to cover in this discussion, and we're hoping to address concerns around the current election, fake news, foreign meddling, surveillance capitalism, voter suppression, and we will also consider strategies to combat electoral interference. We'll be spending around 45 minutes in discussion today and leaving 15 minutes left at the end for questions from the audience. If you press the raise hand feature in our final segment, I'll be able to unmute you, and then you can ask questions directly at our panelists. It's now my pleasure and privilege to introduce our brilliant panel of experts for this evening's discussion. We have David Scheimer, foreign policy analyst and American historian, author of Rigged, America, Russia and 100 Years of Covert Electoral Interference, a must read study of modern history. And David's research makes him one of the world's leading experts on interference strategies. We also have Will Lewis, former CEO of Dow Jones, publisher of the Wall Street Journal and prior to that editor of The Telegraph. Having operated at the upper echelon of the news reporting world, Will can guide us today around the considerations of mainstream media. We have, of course, Anthony Scaramucci, former White House Director of Communications, part of the Trump ticket in 2016, but since 2019 has vehemently opposed the re-election of the president. We're very fortunate to have Anthony with us today. And we also have Dr. Jonathan Yao, expert on Eastern Europe and Russia, Director of International Security Studies at the Royal United Services Institute, one of the world's leading defense think tanks. Uh, thank you all for coming onto our platform today. We really appreciate you guys donating your time to this discussion. Um, the first point of call is to explore the likelihood of a Trump re-election. Um, 538 is putting Biden at a 9.9 .9 lead nationally, which has remained extremely stable throughout all of September and October. Recent swing state polling is indicating a very blue picture indeed for Trump. However, I'd like to each invite each panelist to provide their thoughts on the chances of a Trump re-election and to express any brief concerns they might have around the process of this election. Perhaps we can start with you, David. Sure, thank you um, very much for, for having me. It's a pleasure to, to be on this panel with, with all of these esteemed attendees. Um, I would say that I'm not necessarily a domestic politics expert. I would say that I defer um, to some others as to where this is headed based on the horse race, I think based on public polling and based on where things stand right now, it seems as though by conventional metrics and, and in a conventional election race, Donald Trump appears to be headed toward defeat. I would say, however, that from my vantage point in seeking to track what a country like Russia is seeking to do in interfere in this election, um, which we know it's very actively doing based on the rhetoric and the um, is sworn testimony of the FBI director is that I think a common misconception is that all Russia is after is to help Donald Trump. And therefore, if Donald Trump is losing by a wide margin, then Russia might decide to sit out. And that's just not true. Russia um, is seeking to help Trump and is seeking to hurt Biden, but as a means to an end, which is to degrade, discredit, delegitimize, and seek to tear down American democracy, to make it seem as though our model of governance doesn't actually work, and to make it so citizens do not believe in the outcome of this election. And in that sense, I think there's enormous opportunity to sow chaos, to sow disruption in the weeks ahead, because there's so much doubt that already exists around the legitimacy of our voting process amid a pandemic, amid the president alleging basis, baselessly that the vote is rigged, that from the perspective of a country like Russia, that's fertile ground for sowing chaos, whether by spreading disinformation or disrupting actual infrastructure like voting systems or voter databases in order to make the population believe that the vote can't be trusted, even if in fact it was um, legitimate. Thank you, David. A lot to unpack there. Um, Will, could we have your thoughts now? Well, uh, well, yeah, thanks, Freddie. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. What a great panel. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, probably the best way to... I, I, I got a, In 2016, about this number of days out, I, I went for a tour around Hillary Clinton's campaign headquarters in, in Brooklyn. It was this amazingly kitted out... Um, two floor um, uh, premises and um, uh, 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 and anyone, all anyone wanted to talk about was um, uh, who was gonna get what job in the White House. And I remember actually saying 
to the, the officials there saying you, you do need to cross the line right? you do need to win and she was i mean others will know six or seven points clear right it was done and and then lightning struck right and 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 president trump arrived so the question is does does lightning strike twice um it's extremely unlikely but um, uh, and you've already listed the polls and so on, but but this is all, all elections are unique, but there is something particularly peculiar about this election, a whole series of things that people will be well aware of. There's no real campaign. It's COVID. Biden's effectively just trying to run down the clock, um, uh, hoping that character and COVID does it for him. And obviously, Trump's campaigning has thus far been pretty woeful, right? Um, and he's only just finding his voice late. Um, mm -hmm. But there are a couple of facts just to, just to, you know, which add up to a couple of buts before we declare a Biden victory absolutely certain. Um, uh, there, there, there are, um, uh, there is a real discrepancy amongst Latinos, right? Um, uh, so um, we should talk about that. Um, uh, that that is strengthened, and there is some very interesting polling, um, uh, as Peggy Noonan, I think, is writing about this weekend in the Wall Street Journal. Um, uh, in a Gallup poll, 56% uh, of people polled said, when asked if they're better off than they were four years ago, 56% said they are. Okay. Um, uh, in another poll, there may be another poll. Uh, when people were asked if they thought the country was better off than it was four years ago, only 39% said yes. Okay, so I think that the fascinating thing about this election is, what does this all mean, is how are people going to vote? Are they going to vote for themselves or are they going to vote for the country? Thank you, Will. Very interesting. Anthony, I'd like to give you the chance now to express your thoughts. Well, I... What I would say to Professor Shimer or Shimmer, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce your name, David, but the inferior to democracies are trying to push their deviancy downward in the democratic system. So big shout out to you and I hope people read your book. Uh, you. We are in the fight of our lives in the United States. Uh, and I don't wanna be overly dramatic about that, uh, but you, 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 you know, you don't have to be a psychiatrist to know that Mr. Trump is unwell. If you're watching British football or American football, somebody slides into the other guy, the leg goes in the unnatural direction. You don't have to be an orthopedic surgeon to know that the leg is broken. So you don't need to be a psychiatrist to know that we have somebody that's very malignant, that only really cares about himself, that is going to wreak mental health, physical health destruction further on the people of the United States. And so I'm just gonna say three things. He mishandled the pandemic. Uh, he's lied about the science. He's politicized the wearing of masks. He's disavowed the epidemiologist due to his insecurities and his self-loathing. And it's tipped into and spoiled the economic uh, recovery that really started in the Obama administration that Mr. Trump was expanding, or at least his administration was helped to expand, uh, but they corrupted it through their mismanagement of the healthcare crisis. And the last point is he's made the country weaker as it relates to the American alliances. The post-World War II order that was set up, I'm not saying it doesn't need to be reset. It's 75 years since then, of course it does need to be reset but it, it needs to be reset with America having a very big seat at the table. This America first strategy is actually America alone, as a result of which the president has made the country weaker, sicker, and poorer, uh, and we gotta vote him out of office. Now, is he gonna lose? I don't know. Nate Silver seems to think he is. Uh, I was on his campaign last time. I watched what was happening. Someone asked me if I thought he was gonna win or lose. I thought he would win because of the discontent of the lower middle class and the middle class, and also the polarization of Secretary Clinton. I now think he's going to lose because he is actually the Secretary Clinton of this campaign. He is the polarizing figure. And those people, those lower and middle class people, primarily white ethnics, which frankly 
I am still a member of. I grew up in a blue collar family. My father was uneducated. He was an hourly worker. My mom was a housewife. I understand the dilemma that these people have. Uh, and Mr. Trump has only provided an avatar for their anger. He has not provided a policy, one policy for hope or to renew their aspirations. And so for these reasons, I think he's gonna lose. But my last point, what are we gonna do in the aftermath of it? We have a broken system and a system that needs a lot of healing and a lot of help from some very smart people. Thank you, Anthony. Um, Jonathan, now, could you conclude this segment? Well, let me just go back to what David has said. The greatness of David's book is that it reminded us that uh, the Russian interference in elections is not something new. Uh, he, he, he refers to a hundred years of this. Well, yes. I mean, we tend to forget that the Cold War started in uh, the mid 1940s as a result of Russian falsification of election results in Eastern Europe. So this is actually uh, quite an old thing. I think I'm going to risk, however, taking a slightly different stance. I agree entirely with what David is saying, that the objective at the end is not to actually help. For Mr. Putin, the objective is not to help one candidate or another. I fully believe that he was himself surprised that Trump won the 2016 elections because he believes in conspiracy theories and he couldn't believe that an anti-establishment figure would actually win in the United States. But that was not the problem. The problem was to sow confusion and to discredit democratic political political systems. I think actually the tide is turning. I have no doubt that the Trump camp is going to come up with a lot of claims about votes being uh, uh, printed somewhere else and being dumped in large quantities, about postal ballots being falsified. It's, it's going to be the, the music that we expect. But in reality, at the end of the day, I think the tide is turning. The real turning point on Russia and its ability to interfere was probably 2017 and the elections of Emmanuel Macron in France, when it became clear that it is actually possible uh, to come against it, to fight against it. And the FBI charges to which David uh, referred are a classic example of that. Not merely that we point out now quite openly what the Russians are doing, but we actually have charges against individuals whom we allege are responsible for what is being done. So there's a lot of mopping up to be done. There is a lot of housekeeping that needs to be done with quite frankly, a dysfunctional uh, electoral system in the United States. But I have a feeling that the good days of Mr. Putin enjoying himself in Moscow as we tear each other apart about who won the elections and how legitimate the result uh, is are actually declining. Uh, very, very interesting considerations there, Jonathan. Um, something I would like to zoom in on that was kind of brought up briefly in, in each panelist's opening statement um, was about kind of the relevance of postal voting. We're, we're living in an unprecedented situation where predictions have around 80 million postal votes to be cast in this election. Um, what bearing do the panelists think this will have on the outcome of the election? David, would you like to go first here? All right, I guess I'll, I'll be the first to dive into each, sure. Um, I would say that from a foreign interference perspective, mail-in voting comes as sort of a blessing and a curse. Um, the blessing being that I think it is the unanimous consideration of the US intelligence community that mail-in ballots are actually extraordinarily secure, um, that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to, to affect them um, from the perspective of a foreign adversary. And in that sense, just as paper ballots um, in physical polling places should be the imperative, mail-in ballots um, are, are, are secure based on every metric that I've seen in terms of assessments of foreign adversaries' capabilities. The curse, however, is that they provide the president with a source for disinformation, a, a, an opportunity to spread doubt about the legitimacy of our voting process in a way that can resonate with people. Um, in one survey I saw recently, only 31% of Americans felt very confident that their mail-in ballots would be counted accurately. That's a very low number. That means that there are many millions of Americans in this country who have substantial doubt that their vote will be tallied as such, that their will will actually be expressed at the ballot box. And when the objective of the sitting president, or so it seems, is to make it so that 
he can say, oh, I really won if even though the results say I lost or we'll never know who really won, as he said, that sort of doubt that mail-in ballots create an opportunity for can be a real strategic advantage. So I think from, from an objective standpoint, mail-in ballots are all for the better. Um, I think that security wise, it's all it's all it's all fine, except from the perspective of propaganda and from the perspective of seeking to manipulate how people perceive the election, they do present opportunities to sow confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, can I just add to this one? I mean, the sad thing is that we don't seem to learn from each other in different countries and we sort of uh, are condemned to reinvent the wheel. The reality is that many of the criticisms that are made about the American uh, postal ballot uh, uh, questions have been made in the United Kingdom, which is a similar system in a sense that there isn't an ID, compulsory ID system, and therefore there's always the suspicion that you can somehow trick the system. So there's a few areas that could be addressed and were not done in the United States. First, explain publicly why the system is actually secure. Explain how the two envelopes work. Explain how it is actually quite difficult to trick the system. It was not done in the UK. Well, also large amounts of people believe that the system is vulnerable. Number two, count the postal ballots as soon as possible. It's the gap between the ballots cast on the day of the elections and the counting that is done thereafter that pre puts people's minds, uh, sort of starts asking doubts. And number three, always count. Uh, as a lot of Americans have discovered in 2016 or indeed in 2000, at the beginning of the decade uh, with a hanging chads dispute, in states where someone won by a larger majority uh, than the postal ballots, the postal ballots were often not counted at all, but simply destroyed. That is stupid. It is stupid for the morality or, or indeed for the principles of an election. So there are actually some very basic, robust methods by which these doubts could be dispelled. And Freddie, can I just jump in there? Yeah. The, the, to, to, to add to that, I mean, th there's a broader picture about um, the amount of postal votes is that turnout looks like it's going to be an historic high, right? So I think my numbers are right, forgive me or not, I think about 138 million voted last time, 137, 138. And I mean, pick a number, but it's 150, 160 this time, which has to be a good thing, right? So actually, ultimately, the point, and I'm not just, this isn't me disagreeing around the issues around postal voting, um, but the fact is that actually the, the, this, this election could have quite a profound impact on the democratization of elections going forward. So it's quite a, it's gonna be an historic election from that regard, one way or another. Absolutely. I mean, over the summer, America saw some of the um, most violent riots of recent memory, catalyzed, of course, by the shocking murder of George Floyd. Um, Trump and Biden have taken opposing stances as a result of the unrest of the president pushing a far more law and order ticket, whilst his rival has promoted a far more inclusive narrative. Um, which attitude, Anthony, do you think is more likely to win over American voters? Well, again, I believe the majority of the American voters will be won over by the latter, but I just want to remind everybody of something that I'm worried about, again, and I, and I take it from my own personal background. If you have blue collar people that were aspirational like my father, meaning they thought that a few of their children were going to go on to live the American dream, and there was a certain satisfaction in that, in 35 short years, those people have converted into economically desperational people. Uh, they are prone and open to conspiracy theory because what happens is you don't want to blame it all on yourself. You want to say, okay, man, I'm, I'm not doing well because the system is rigged against me and it's rigged against my family. And there must be some nefarious cabal or a deep state that's doing this to me. And so when Mr. Trump is preying on those people and talking about those things, and when it gets linked to the nonsense like the QAnon conspiracy, uh, you can get a lot of people in that category. Can you get 51% of the people? I believe no. He needs 46% and a perfect demographic blend across swing states to win the election. Can he get that again this time? I believe no, uh, but it's there. And so what we have to do when this is over, we have to come up with the right policies to 
put the anger aside and to suggest to these people that over time themselves and their families are going to do better being plugged into the system rather than rejecting the system and thinking of some sort of ridiculous conspiracy. Um, the conspiracy aspect kind of brings us onto this era of uh, misinformation that we live in. I mean, we've got to the stage now where, you know, fake news being the Trumpite buzzword of the last election. Um, why is it that people don't trust mainstream media services yet are often accept the false information they are bombarded with via targeted ad campaigns, for instance, on social media? How have we got here? Who's well, that for? I Oh, well, that's that's an it's open question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, at the risk of stating the obvious, one of the factors is, of course, that I personally believe the strongest factor is that the uh, curatorial functions which established media organizations used to exercise uh, in the in the past simply doesn't exist. So you bought a paper, so you, the paper may have been good or bad, but someone exercised some filtering capabilities and some of these filtering capabilities were better than others. You're bombarded from all sources. And for most people, the result is that you end up, I mean, one of the beauties of the internet is that it flattens uh, everything. Whether you read the New York Times or whether you do a website from your bedroom can technically look the same. So the entry point for a lot of the rubbish that was always there is much higher than it has been before in, in sort of technical terms. And that creates uh, the sort of mentality. And then the engagement with the media, the sheer quantity means that our engagement is very, very simple. I mean, I work quite a bit with the, um, with the unit in the European Union that is trying to rebut uh, some of the conspiracy theories circulated by Russia. And very often what happens is just to try to persuade people don't retweet or don't send on any nonsense that someone has sent to you, like a video clip, which may be completely fabricated. So it's a mixture of a technology which allows you a very easy entry point and the huge bombardment uh, of information, which actually makes it very difficult for most people to discriminate. Yeah, Freddie, can I jump in there? I, I think yeah. uh, to add to that, the, I mean, clearly this election is highlighting this, this, this crisis. Of all the crises facing the world, I, I, I think all of us would agree that the misinformation crisis is the, is the most profound. It, it is having a, a significant impact in how people vote, in how people act, in decisions they make. And this absence of... of factual information is is really is really harming society and and it, it's complicated what's brought it about and therefore the the way to resolve it is also complicated but in no particular order the foxification of media um needing to pick a side uh to believe their version of the facts has been really impactful um uh, in other countries, to broaden out from the US, uh, well-meaning uh, but overzealous regulation has created an equally uh, uh, difficult situation, that pernicious balance that's been exemplified by the BBC, for example, where regulation requires uh, the media outlet to say, he said, she said, and that masquerades as news, with some kind of independent analyst saying, neither side are right, uh, is equally damaging for for people's ability to understand what's really going on. And then a third thing, which is where traditional media companies have to accept um, uh, some, uh, some of the, uh, the focus here, is that the free passes have been given to Chinese government, Russian governments, companies masquerading as media companies, PR companies. Um, and if you then throw in malicious fake news as well, you have a really toxic mix um, that, that, that means that ordinary people literally don't know what to believe. Um, and this is, this is a genuine crisis. Yeah, and, 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 and to build on that, I agree completely. And I think that it's a crisis for several reasons. It's a crisis because in a democracy, you're supposed to be, to be able to have fact-based, inclusive debates around policy issues, and then the better idea sort of wins the day. 
And that is not what's happening at all in America right now, because there's no consensus around what the facts are. You could have 95% of one political party believe X and 95% of another political party believe the exact opposite, not around opinions as to how something is working, but rather about what the literal underlying truth is, what the diagnosis of the problem is. And therefore you end up debating not how to fix something, but what that something really um, is, which not only debilita debilitates progress, but debilitates the very notion that your democracy is working. The, the second reason it's a crisis is because it allows or creates a vacuum for leaders to assume the role of the communicator of facts. Because rather than have the media saying, this is what's going on, this is, this is sort of the state of affairs in the United States, you can instead have a leader say, you can't trust the media, you can't trust reporters, you can only trust me. And that's um, you know, a very well-trodden path. That's something that many leaders have done abroad. Um, in some ways, it's a very Russian attitude of saying, you know, the media is spectacle, the news is spectacle, um, nothing really matters, but the only thing that does matter is just your willingness to do whatever I say me being the leader or to follow my, my, my directives or example. And then the third reason I think this is a real crisis is because having these divisions around facts, around um, information present, again, great opportunities for manipulation by domestic or foreign actors, because foreign actors, for instance, don't create domestic fissures. They exploit them. They blow them up. They pour gasoline on them. And when we are so divided, when we're at war with one another internally over what's true and what isn't, that creates great opportunity to spread disinformation, um, to turn or pit Americans against one another, because we're already pitted against each other, regardless of what foreign actors do. Well, let's continue on this line of, of foreign actors. I mean, until very recently, um, very little had been speculated to suggest that foreign powers were attempting to interfere. That is until... Of course, yesterday, when um, Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe publicly announced that both Russia and Iran had obtained American voting registration information, and the latter was immediately utilizing it in an attempt to ha harm Trump's chances of re-election. How much influence do you think foreign interference is having on this election as it stands? David, perhaps you can... Sure. I mean, I, 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 I would disagree a bit with that characterization. I don't think that yesterday was the start of the story of Russian or Iranian interference in the 2020 election. Um, I think there have been signs, reports and testimonies around this for months and months, um, going back to when Robert Mueller testified or Fiona Hill testified that Russia either was doing this right now or intended to or never stopped. And that was over a year ago um, to in August when the DNI or the office of the DNI announced that Russia, Iran, and China um, were targeting the election, but more specifically Russia, um, in favor of Donald Trump or to denigrate Joe Biden and to sow discord. You've seen in recent months, Facebook and Twitter um, announced takedowns of covert Russian networks of accounts. You've seen Microsoft announce that Russia was seeking to steal um, the personal information or emails of hundreds of American political figures. You've seen DHS announce that Russia is amplifying disinformation around voter fraud um, and around Joe Biden's mental health. And then now you've seen new reports that Russian intelligence is targeting state and local computer networks, which could give it access to state election infrastructure. And then, of course, there's this side question of the Ukraine um, story, the emergence of new emails and very um, open and glaring questions as to how those came about and what their underlying source is. And so I think that Russia is trying. Um, to interfere in this election. They're trying to repeat their 2016 playbook. I think that in some ways we're more vulnerable because of COVID and the sitting president, but in other ways to give credit where credit is due, we are not, for instance, spreading these, you know, confusingly sourced emails all over the mainstream media. That has not been happening in the same way it did four years ago. Reporters are being much more judicious in their coverage of these contents. Um, you have the FBI director and other senior law enforcement officials being very transparent um, and very proactive in seeking to defend our electoral processes, the NSA director and others as well. And so, and you have social media companies working with FBI to take down these networks. So Russia is interfering in this election. That's a fact um, that has been proven time and time again but whether it will end up proving as potentially effective as 2016 was, I think it remains to be seen. I think the obvious point of attack is when vote, votes are being cast and when ballots are being counted um, in order to try to achieve Russia's strategic objectives. So I'll see or we'll see what Russia does in the next two or so weeks. But for now, they're trying. I don't think anyone would say that it's had the reach that 2016 did. Is there anything you would want to add here, Jonathan? Yes, I mean, uh, all that uh, David has said is, of course, correct. And I one would add also 
uh, that Vice President Pence made uh, a year ago uh, allegations about Chinese interference in the electoral process, which may or may not be true, but definitely need to be brought into the equation as well. I think, um, uh, let, let's be honest, it, 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 the real surprise is that we didn't have this discussion about interference in the American electoral process up to now, because if you think about it, the United States must be the prize target for most countries around the world uh, when it comes to its electoral system, partly because of its size, partly because of its concentration of power with one president and therefore the, uh, the, 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 the sort of decisive impact of an electoral outcome. So the surprise is that we're talking about it only over the last decade uh, rather than much earlier. Uh, to add to what David has done, uh, said, which I completely agree that we are in a much better position now than we were in 2016. Uh, there is the other element, which is the intelligence community helping politicians secure their own communications in order to prevent the interference that has taken place. That's a straight uh, uh, lesson from the copybook of France and the French electoral system, when one of the key objectives of the French uh, uh, intelligence services was to try to foolproof as much as possible the communications of politicians. One of the biggest problems that we have is that politicians uh, still were insecure, or unfamiliar with the challenges facing them, and very often were vulnerable. They are less vulnerable today. Well, let's let's talk about history. If we go back to um, 2016, um, we have Russia sowing seeds of doubt into the integrity of the voting process. Anthony, as somebody who was on that campaign, on that ticket, how did that feel? What were you aware of, and um, did you feel uncomfortable? No, I, you know, we, we were never really aware of it and we didn't feel uncomfortable about it. In fact, you know, the joke inside the campaign was that uh, Mr. Trump can't even collude with his staff members. How the hell is he colluding with the Russians? So what we, re we really felt was happening is they were probably, in hindsight, now we looking back, we'd say they were definitely trying to help. Uh, but I do believe, and you could ask uh, John Brennan, you could ask Leon Panetta, you could ask others, uh, former CIA directors and others, that the Russians were actually quite surprised that Mr. Trump had actually won. Their, 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 their job in those active measures was just to create that distrust that everyone on the panel is talking about, but not necessarily see a Trump victory. When he won, uh, then they started to re recolorize things. But uh, listen, the, uh, the Hunter Biden situation is an example of what Professor Schimmer is saying about the press and the social media people saying, okay, we're gonna dial this down. Well, some people are calling it censorship, but other people are just calling it flat out fact checking and preventing and blocking disinformation. So uh, I think that's good news. Uh, but what I think is really bad news is that there is a group of cynical politicians, not just in the United States, but around the West that will use and want to be aided and abetted by sinister people and sinister foreign actors. And so what I'm hoping will happen is uh, the vice president will win. Uh, we'll need to think about a lot of different things in the country and the likelihood will be that there'll be a constitutional amendment or two. We haven't had a major one. We had a procedural one in 93, but our last major seismic constitutional amendment was 55 years ago. There are 27 amendments. Uh, you, you should be getting one every eight years. And unfortunately, we haven't been getting them. Uh, and I think we need one now. And one will be a check on the presidency and perhaps even moving the Justice Department out of the executive branch. A lot mm -hmm. of things have to happen here to tighten up our democracy. Yeah, perhaps some amendments could um, focus on surveillance capitalism. Um, if you talk about Cambridge Analytica, for instance, um, playing a big part in um, elections such as 2016 and, of course, in Brexit as well. Um, Sorry, can I just can I just jump in? Because I think a really absolutely. important I think a really important point Anthony just made, which is that the problem right now is that there's a comfort or there's been a comfort by leaders um, to solicit rather than deter foreign interference in our elections. That is a new phenomenon at the major party level. Where in 1960, for instance, the Soviet Union tried to do this. Um, they approached, they had their ambassador approach, Adlai Stevenson, a leading democratic politician at the time, and offer um, from the Kremlin itself to say, we want to help you get elected president. What can we do to help you win? 
to which Adlai Stevenson more or less said, get the hell away from me. I want nothing to do with this. I would rather lose without this involvement than perhaps, you know, get elected with, with foreign help. In 1968, it was the same story. The Soviet Union again tried to approach, um, this time Hubert Humphrey, um, to offer to fund his campaign. And as they tried to make that offer through its ambassador um, in a one-on-one -on -one private meeting, Humphrey changed the subject, again, signaling, I want nothing to do with this, get the hell away from me. And so I think we need to get back to that mindset, to that mindset of pride around our sovereignty, of recognizing that if you purport to be a politician of a democracy, then you should rather lose on your own than win with the help of a foreigner. Because of course, if you win with the help of a foreigner, as we know throughout history of these operations across Latin America, Europe, and elsewhere, then you're indebted to that foreigner. Then you psychologically feel as though you're in your chair in part because someone else helped you get there and you didn't say, don't do it. I don't want your um, aid. I don't want your support. And so for our own sovereignty, for the own functioning of our government, there should be a bipartisan norm or tradition that there used to be that if foreigners want to screw with our elections and they try to approach or get involved in it, then every politician in this country should be saying, get the hell away from us. You should not be involved in our elections. And unfortunately, that has not been the case in recent years from one side. Um, but I hope that moving forward, we can get back to that um, place we used to be at least. Yeah, very, very interesting point. Um, I think also something needs to be said as well about um, uh, politicians being able to solicit companies such as Cambridge Analytica, etc, um, to complement their own campaigns. I mean, a, a recent study released today by uh, yesterday by Channel 4 News, um, showed that all the data that Cambridge Analytica had collected on Black American voters who they tried to disenfranchise um, over the 2016 election. Does some legal framework need to be put in place to preclude the involvement of companies like Cambridge Analytica who often collect data without people knowing um, that it's being used um, to suppress their votes? Um, perhaps we can have um, Jonathan start us off here. Uh, sorry, I just I just want to I mean um, uh, to uh, to David's point, he has some very uh, substantial um, uh, sort of uh, historic uh, evidence, but of course all of it was in the sense of trying to suggest some sort of uh, a, 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 a political framework to help a candidate win. Uh, what we have now is, of course, a very direct involvement in the procedures themselves. I think Anthony's point is right. I think we need to look at these electoral systems. We need to look at the plumbing of the electoral system. We need to look at, uh, especially in countries that have federal systems with uh, varying levels of, of structures about how it operates. We do need a wholesale change because the difference between the examples that uh, David quite rightly uh, adduced and today is of course that a lot of what is happening today has a plausible deniability sufficient uh, in order not to have any fingerprints over what is going on. Understood. Would anyone else like to add anything here? No, well then let's, um, we're gonna to come to questions in a few minutes, but I would like to um, discuss now combating interference tactics. I mean, one, one strategy that's been put forward would be um, hate speech laws. Um, and we're starting to see some of the realities of this now on Facebook and Twitter, especially in regards to the Hunter Biden emails. Um, however, this can lead to a whole host of problems, especially in countries where democracy is fairly threadbare. Um, fake news laws can often be viewed as a form of censorship um, and any attempt to prevent the people from criticizing each other and the government. Do you think hate speech laws have any place in trying to counter the rise of fake news? Perhaps, Will, you can start us off. Um, yeah, look, I, I think there's something in that, but I, look, I, Freddie, I, I, I think there's a, a, a bigger issue here, um, which is obviously my obsession, which is the absence, well, the, 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 the old and traditional media industry is in, in rapid decline now, right? COVID has really accelerated the, 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 the things that were already in, you know, taking place. So it's really sped up disruption. But the new ecosystem uh, and in, news industry hasn't yet formed, right? And hasn't taken hold. So we're in this really dangerous time where it's really, really straightforward to exploit that, that kind of delta 
Um, and that's what's happening. And I think, so ergo, that's that's the hole that needs filling in my mind. Um, I mean, the, the, the big absence here is, is the establishment of a sustainable journalistic model that enables the pursuit of facts that shine a, shine a light on wrongdoing in society. Because um, I, you know, fake news, as, as the experts will undoubtedly know, uh, agree with and have written, has been around for for hundreds of years. It's it's the it's the uh, velocity of circulation of it uh, that is now the significant change. I don't I don't think even with law changes and tightening up and all the stuff we've been talking about that that's going to be solved anytime soon. This is a problem that's going to be around for for dare I say it Freddie, all of your life. Right, um, it's going to be a, a, a debate you're having. So we we all, we need to deal with that. But we also need to we also need to flood the gap with factual information. And I think that's 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 something that that we all need to to think about how we're going to fund that and pay for that uh, critical factual information. Very very interesting topic. Um, I, I think something also needs to be discussed as well about kind of the role social, social media companies have as well and allowing this to proliferate on their platforms. I mean, Facebook has conducted re research, research into algorithmic identification of fake news. And one of their models proved highly successful identifying fake news over 99% of the time. However, this was disputed by another Yale study, which said there was a minimal improvement in readers' ability to identify fake news, only 3.7%. So is there something here to be said about the, the responsibility of each individual when we're consuming our, our news, uh, be it on, online or via print, um, to be able to spot and understand when something is being targeted um, and when it is trying to change the uh, mindset, especially in the midst of an election? And um, David, perhaps you could answer this. Sure, and I, I, I can. I also want to sort of piggyback off a point Will just made, which I think is is, is profoundly important around our, our, our required humility um, around saying, you know, we're going to secure our election or we're going to respond to this issue of fake news and we're going to resolve it all together. And I think that that might make sense in a bubble of 2016 if you act as though this issue only emerged a few years ago and therefore should be resolvable. But in fact, that's just entirely not true. Um, you know, the issue of fake news, as he said, but also the issue of foreign electoral intervention has, as you know, I wrote, been around for a very long time, for, for 100 years, even more than that, and have involved massive operations to interfere in elections in places like Italy, Chile, Japan, the United States, the United Kingdom, you know, Germany, Colombia, El Salvador, you name it, all over the world on a global basis across these historical phases with very historically consistent methods around manipulating public opinion or around manipulating actual infrastructure. And just as in 1920, Vladimir Lenin recognized that you could penetrate and manipulate open elections, so too has Vladimir Putin seen that in 2020, and so too will whomever see that um, who's in the Kremlin 50 years from now, because open elections definitionally, open spaces, open environments, open systems of governments definitionally are penetrable and manipulatable. And it's on us to manage these threats, to try to make them as contained and marginal as possible in their significance. But I think anyone who says we have secured this election or we have secured our elections absolutely in perpetuity moving forward, I wouldn't trust that person because I don't think that makes any sense. Um, and I think you can secure your infrastructure. But in terms of securing your information environment, I don't see how an open democracy can do that while maintaining the values um, and the laws that make it such a system. Jonathan, were you going to make an additional point there? Uh, yeah, I wholly concur with what David is, uh, is saying about the need for humility uh, on a lot of these things about what can actually be done. Uh, uh, first, uh, let us uh, uh, not forget that even if we have an algorithm that could identify when people are trying to change opinions, as you put it, uh, the reality is the change of opinion is what the democratic system is all about. So I wouldn't like someone to block me out from social media just because I'm fighting to change an opinion. It's my right to try to change people's opinion. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, very often people do it with selective uh, quotes of uh, facts or with what is now termed alternative facts. So uh, I, I'm a bit skeptical about how much this could be done by blocking. 
Uh, mm -hmm. I also am a bit skeptical about how much the social media companies end up behaving as publishers themselves, which is the way we're going to go if you're going to put on them the onus of responsibility. And I am a bit worried that, for instance, on the Hunter Biden allegations, uh, which I agree with David, the whole issue, the way it came about, is extremely fishy with a lot of questions that need to be asked. But nevertheless, there is a narrative now, even among mainstream Republicans, uh, that social media platforms in the United States have not acted correctly by trying to block something uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that looks uh, unfavorable uh, to the Democrats. I'm not making a judgment on what the allegations are. I'm merely saying that you're getting into quite a difficult area. Understood. Um, I'm now going to be taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please just raise your hand and I'll be able to unmute you. We have one raised hand already. So I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, Cameron Essien. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, all, all good. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. It's been very insightful. Um, I just wanted to dig a little deeper into that international aspect and say, look, we're seeing lots of evidence of interference from various nations. But on the flip side, do you think we're seeing enough international cooperation um, from, the, from the states pushing that message of democracy and governmental um, legitimacy? And if not, what needs to change? Thank you, Cameron. So who would like to kick us off here? I can, I can jump in if you if you want. Yeah. Um, David, go I, ahead. I, I, I would say that the answer is absolutely not. Um, I think there was an enormous call to action in 2016 or thereafter for there to be that type of international movement against covert electoral interference operations, but there has been none. Um, I was struck in my research I interviewed the president of Montenegro, whom Russian intelligence tried to assassinate. I interviewed the former president of Colombia. I interviewed intelligence chiefs across Europe and elsewhere, all of whom effectively said the same thing to me, which is that we stand alone, that we're trying to defend our elections in isolation with no real cooperation with our allies for, or support from the United States, while the very heart of our sovereignty is under siege, which is our electoral processes. And to me, at least, that is a gross error on the part of American foreign policy. And I think it's not playing to one of our strengths, which is that if we work with our allies, if we push back against actors like Russia in a collective cooperative fashion, we have far more leverage and far more, far more influence to actually affect change. And so to me, in terms of how to secure our elections to the degree that it's possible to do so, I think you need to do two things at once. On the one hand, you need to you know, build a stronger foundation domestically by securing your infrastructure, mitigating the effectiveness of influence operations, and by investing in core domestic priorities that make us less polarized and more fortified. But at the same time, you also need to be marshalling a movement abroad where you're working with your allies to detect and deter these types of operations to interfere not only in our elections, but in the elections of democracies around the world. It's a myth and a dangerous one that this is just an American problem, that the only country whose elections are being targeted are the United States. That is so wholly not true. And all you have to do is talk to any leader or any journalist, really, in any um, of these other democracies who would tell you that very readily. So I think America, hopefully moving forward, will work with our allies in defense of the democratic model, will push back collectively against Russia and impose costs on countries like Russia when they do target the elections, not just of our country, America, but also of the, of the elections of our allies. And I think if we're able to do that, we'll be in a much stronger position than we are right now. Thank you, David. Um, Jonathan, do you want to make a quick, quick additional point? Very, very quick. Uh, just to emphasize David's point, I think this, this cooperation works best if it is done before any particular election. Because cooperating and trying to work out what has happened after an election is always politically very controversial. We have the example of 2016. The British intelligence could uh, got very, very um, uh, nervous about contributing to various congressional inquiries. 
mainly because it became such a hot, controversial political, party political issue in the United States, the election of President Trump. The same has happened in other uh, uh, countries. So we're learning from it. For instance, the German uh, way, uh, the way the Germany is now trying to treat the penetration of Russian intelligence services into the German parliament's uh, computer systems uh, has uh, borrowed a lot of the mechanisms uh, from the French one, preventive, together before an election takes place when it is possible to have this cooperation without political connotations. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, William, I'm going to allow you to talk now. You can ask your question to the panellists. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great stuff. Again, thank you guys so much for the talk today. It's been really, really interesting. So one thing I just wanted to um, quickly ask was to do with the US's, um, how they've interfered in elections around the world. So obviously throughout history, especially during the Cold War, they acted to try and contain communism. And I was wondering, do you think the CIA, the CIA are still conducting uh, interference operations today to try and um, interfere in different elections? And if, if they are, do they need to be the first to kind of step back and lead this united front, as you were saying earlier, to try and prevent countries um, from being interfered by other powers? So, yeah. Thank you, Will. That's a, a big question. So I'm going to ask for a brief answer here. Um, David, would you like to again? Yeah. I think this is your bread and butter, so you can go ahead. Sure. So, so exactly. And in my book, that that some of the panelists very kindly referenced, I um I I, I look at both Soviet and Russian um, interference in elections, but I also look at the history of American interference in elections because I think it's a mistake to only study one aspect of this history. You need a complete story to draw from it the patterns, the facts that will enable us and empower us to defend ourselves now. I think it's a matter of the historical record as I document that the CIA interfered, CIA interfered in elections aggressively um, in support of predominantly centrist candidates during the Cold War in competition with the KGB. I think that post Cold War, based on my research, the CIA has moved away from this practice, but has not banned it. For instance, I interviewed Bill Clinton, who told me about an operation he authorized to interfere covertly um, in the Serbian election in 2000 to work against the tyrant Slobodan Milosevic, um, on the, uh, which, which culminated in, in his actually losing that election um, and him being removed or falling from power after a popular movement against him. And so I think America's in a rather strange spot right now where it has not banned this practice, but it also is not executing it with the same degree of regularity that it once did. For example, in Iraq in 2005, the Bush administration debated extensively whether to target that election using the CIA, but opted against it because they were too worried about getting caught, um, which they thought would undermine America. And they thought without the call to action of containment, this wasn't something that America should be doing in the post-Cold War world. To me, that's right. I think that not issuing judgments about the past, but looking toward the future, covert operations to interfere in elections have no place in American foreign policy. I think it aligns neither with our interests nor our values to be doing or executing the very type of practice that we're trying to get other countries to unite against and to get other countries not to execute. So I think moving forward, we should ban this practice proactively. We should work to establish a coalition of countries against it. Um, and we should not at all um, get down in the mud with Russia covertly and seeking to manipulate electoral outcomes, whatever the short term gains of what that might be. In the long term, it'll undermine us. It will undermine our efforts to secure electoral processes. Um, and tarnish yeah. our, our image abroad. Thank you, David. I'm just we've got quite a few questions, so I'm going to give uh, the floor to D. D. Hi. Um, I would firstly like to thank you all for your time and for your insights. But um, I have a question for Anthony. Um, at the moment, it's quite clear that America is divided, um, really polarized it's ac across a lot of different avenues, and. I was wondering what you think about how we can heal these divides after the election, um, regardless of the outcome. And maybe could you give an insight as to which presidential candidate you think would be better placed to uh, bring people together? Thank you. For 2020 or for beyond, you mean other presidential candidates or between Joe Biden and, and I mean, uh, Donald as, Trump? In terms of the current election. The current election. Well, I obviously think it would be the vice president because he is signaling to people that he wants to be president for all Americans, not just his tribe. And I think one of the problems is you've got a red tribal leadership going and a blue tribal leadership, and we're going to need somebody that's transformative. I do believe that this is fixable. 
Uh, but I want to remind everybody uh, and put some historical context on this. If you read the final days, uh, which was written by Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, it was a secondary book to All the President's Men. Uh, they interview many of the Republican senators and they said to them, why did you turn on Richard Nixon? And one of them, uh, I believe it was Bob Dole, said, well, I told Mr. Nixon that I was fighting in Italy and my best friend's head blew up next to me. He was shot by a German Nazi sniper. And I thought of him when you were breaking the law. And he fought and gave his life for the document, for the Constitution, and for our freedom. And even though we're in the same party, my patriotism, my call to duty to serve the country is more important than my partisanship. And so uh, fast forward now 47 years, 45 years, and we're in a situation where people's calls to duty, if you will, are more about partisanship and the preservation of their own power. And so I do think American leadership is going to need to require more civic teaching, more civic virtue, even, and a lot of people disagree with me on this, may not even be popular, but a call to national service like other countries have where uh, kids come out of high school and they serve in the United States in some form or another. It doesn't necessarily have to be the military. And I will point out that as we've had less mi military integration, meaning you've got someone from South Dakota that served in the military with someone from New York, that served with somebody from Texas, all of a sudden we see how common we are as opposed to how divisive and how geographically uh, fragmented our culture can be. So these are things that we could do uh, to cure this. I, I predict it will be cured. Uh, it's going to be a rough period of time for America. Uh, but it's a very resilient country. And there's a lot of people in this country that really love it uh, and are willing to put their patriotism at a higher order than their partisanship. The reason why I'm with the vice president, like my friends at the Lincoln Project, I'm a lifelong Republican, uh, but I do believe that Mr. Trump is a systemic threat to the American democracy, the institutions of our democracy, the checks and balances of our democracy. And so that's why I'm with the vice president. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, one last question here from Aaron, permitting you to talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, so we've heard a lot about foreign and specifically Russian interference uh, in elections and how it's being carried out with the aim not of electing a specific person, i.e. Trump, um, but to undermine the credibility in electoral systems. So my question is, uh, what is the end goal beyond this for Russia? Um, what exactly is Russia seeking to gain for itself? Uh, and does it come back to trying to strengthen faith in Putin's regime at home? Uh, Jonathan, perhaps you can give the answer. Here. Well, I mean, there's a multitude of objectives. Uh, the first one is let us not forget uh, that this is a force multiplier for Russia. Uh, if Mr. Putin were paid his two pounds and attended our webinar now, I think he would have rather enjoyed the fact that we spent about half the time talking uh, about a country that actually has a third world uh, economy. Uh, so in many respects, it gives him a footprint. Uh, but at the same time, it allows him, I mean, we tend to underestimate how much these operations are also defensive. Uh, he believes that he is subjected to our export of democracy measures and that all he's doing is he's paying us back for what we're doing to him. Um, so there is an element of righteousness about it as well from his perspective. And ultimately what he seeks to achieve is to undermine the unity of a Western community to discredit the idea that there is uh, a superior political system, to discredit the idea of participatory democracy, to create or encourage a sense of cynicism about our institutions and about our politics in order to paralyze it, us from doing anything. And the ultimate dream, of course, is what the Russians will call the multipolar world in which Russia itself will regain some influence. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm mindful of the time, but almost on an hour. I'd like to thank every single panelist for lending your insights, your expertise on this absolutely important and essential conversation. Um, we will be back on the 5th of November to debate the grounds for rioting. 
Thank you very much from the OFQE and thank you to T45 for their sponsorship of this event. Uh, good night and good evening. Cheers.